Okay, so I will talk about uh, the QMM scheme that can be used uh, together with the, the, the classical MD uh, simulation. So I took the slides from my previous advisor, uh, Quan Hu Nam. Um, I asked, of course, for, for permission for this part. And yes, uh, I think they are very well uh, prepared. The material is quite clear. So this was part of a talk that he gave at the Charm GUI workshop uh, some months ago. So what's the goal of the QMM simulation? Or what is a system where the QMM simulation can be applied? Uh, this could be used for studying you know, catalytic reactions, for instance, in enzymes. And here, for instance, in the red curve, I show you a typical uh, profile of an uncatalyzed uh, reaction, right? Like for instance, the, the, the phosphoryl transfer from ADP to ADP. And if this uh, reaction occurs in water, in the uh, so-called uncatalyzed reaction, you observe in general a very large uh, energy barrier, right? And this energy barrier can be translated into some uh, time the scale uh, with the help, for instance, of the iron equation. And this gives us an idea of how fast the process uh, can be. So what if this reaction occurs in an enzyme, in general, the energy barrier decreases, which makes the, the process feasible in in the living conditions of an organism, right? So this reaction involves uh, the, the bone breaking and forming. And because of that, not all the molecular dynamics schemes can handle it. Uh, and there are some approaches to, to deal with that in, with the classical MD simulations, but in general, the force fields are not prepared for seeing at the bone breaking and forming, right? And this is where the quantum chemistry uh, comes into play to study bone breaking and forming. And in particular, these type of enzymatic reactions are, are a good target. The basic methodology, we saw before that we need a potential energy function, and this can be obtained with some force field, chamber, amber, emptying tube, or a coarse grain method we saw before a martini. There are also a go potential where they use a bias uh, towards some specific conformation, for instance, and then we need to uh, search uh, through the potential energy surface. There are uh, several uh, mechanisms. For instance, we can do some geometry optimization with different algorithms, steepest descent, the conjugate gradient, uh, newton raphson and so on. And this will allow us to uh, detect what are the minimum and maximum uh, structures, uh, which are uh, the reactant and product states and the transition state. And it also allows us to, to search 
the conformational space at temperature zero, right? But if we want to turn on the temperature, then we can uh, take the molecular dynamics scheme uh, where we saw before, this is the uh, solution of the Newton dynamics by means of some algorithm, Berle, Berle velocity, we saw before the leapfrog. We can also include uh, Langevin dynamics, Carparinello, and the ensembles MPT, MVT, or MVT, and an, a different approach to uh, solving the Newton's equations uh, is by using the Monte Carlo simulations, right? Uh, in this case, we don't propagate the, the equations of motions, but instead we use a, a sampling, a random method to uh, search across the landscape. There are different methods, for instance, the classical metropolis uh, or the Gibbs ensemble Monte Carlo and so on. So there are more specific methods for the potential energy function, which include, for instance, a quantum mechanical method. So here in this set of uh, models, we need some uh, specific uh, parameters that are determined uh, empirically, either by experiments or by using uh, some uh, accurate quantum mechanical method. But if we want to avoid the parameterization, then we can go to a quantum, a pure quantum chemical method. And here we can see that there are different flavors as well. For instance, ab initio, where we can find Hartree-Fock, muller placet or Koppel cluster. And we have also the density functional theory. And in between, we can find uh, semi-empirical uh, methods, AM1, PM3, and the DFTB, which is uh, related to the density functional uh, theory, but in the semi-empirical uh, scheme. There are also hybrid methods where we combine different schemes. Here we can see uh, the QMM method that we will deal with today. One can also combine the molecular mechanics and the coarse grain and do some uh, type of layers in a simulation where we treat parts of the system quantum mechanically, other parts uh, classical, the classical mechanics and the rest with coarse grain. This is also possible. And we need to uh, take into account that the cost of running these simulations uh, increases uh, drastically. For instance, it takes long time to run classical MD simulations than the coarse grain ones. But if we include the quantum mechanical part in a classical uh, simulation, it takes longer than in MM. And the same is for the, the pure quantum mechanical method. So uh, how to visualize the QMM potential? Uh, here, I show you a protein and Inside this protein, there is some uh, specific site where uh, a catalytic reaction occur. For instance, I mentioned the transfer of a phosphory group from one molecule to another. And this could be part of the QMM region. This is the part where the reaction occurs. And this, of course, makes the cost of the QMM calculation 
uh, lower because we will not treat the entire system quantum mechanically, but just some specific region of interest. And here we can see the bone breaking and forming. So how to write the Hamiltonian? Uh, one way to write it is by using this expression. We have a Hamiltonian for the quantum mechanical part, a Hamiltonian for the classical part. This is solved by the force field. This one is solved by the quantum chemistry in code. And the problem will be how to deal with the interaction between the quantum mechanical and the classical mechanics simulation. So in more detail, this QMM M, uh, Hamiltonian is written as a sum of uh, three terms. And these are the electrostatic terms for the interaction between QMM and, uh, QM and M charges the van der Waals part and the boundary atoms, right? So uh, this is computed uh, by the quantum chemistry package in general. And this part is computed by the classical force field, unless your software offers of other uh, possibilities, but in NAMD it's computed entirely by the MM a package, in this case, NAMD. And there are some options to modify the parameters for the bundle valves interactions, right? And the boundary atoms. So we saw before that for classical M, M, M simulations, we need to solve the Newton's equations, which is, uh, is put in term into a Hamiltonian. In the case of the QM uh, Hamiltonian, we have the following. We write the Hamiltonian as a function of the nuclear uh, coordinates. And this part can be written as a sum of uh, the, the, nuclear, the nuclear part or the atomic part, the classical MM charges, and also uh, in terms of the electrons. This part uh, relates to the uh, nuclei and the atomic part, and this part is related to the electrons. Here, for instance, we are computing the interaction between the nuclei and uh, the electrons. This is the pure electron electron repulsion. And this is the part related to the nuclear uh, repulsion. So this gives us the, the total pot QMM potential energy function. And it is known that uh, we can separate the the wave functions for the electrons and the nuclei. And this means that we can write the total wave function as a product of the wave function from the electrons and the nuclei separately. So in this way, the total energy can be written as a sum of the QMM electronic part and the nuclei part, right? And in general, uh, if we use the von Oppenheimer approximation, this term is computed classically, right? And we need we, we can only add this at the end of the of the energy computation, the electronic energy computation, um, and this is just a post post uh, addition to the total energy. So for the electronic uh, degrees of freedom, we need to solve this uh, equation here, right? And the electronic Hamiltonian 
is written as a sum of three terms. This is the kinetic energy part, the interaction with the nuclei and the electron-electron repulsion. So this can be done in several ways. And one of the way to do that is by using the linear uh, combination of atomic orbitals, right? And these uh, functions here are also called the basis set. You will see uh, that in the computational chemistry codes. And the results uh, would depend on the type of basis function that you use and how large they are. So the determinant comes from the fact that the wave function is anti-symmetric and this takes into account, this is taken into account into this uh, determinant. So we can uh, resolve for this Hamiltonian here. And after we get uh, this uh, solution, we can just add the contribution from the nuclei. So that's, that's what uh, we did in the Boron-Penheimer approximation. We allow the nuclei to move as if they were classical particles, but at each uh, time step, we are computing the electronic wave function. So how to solve this problem? So we can use a variational uh, process where we know that any trial uh, function that we, we take will be larger or equal than the exact wave function, uh, the, the exact energy that we don't know, but we can approximate it. So the variational process is uh, done by taking the derivatives with respect to the coefficients in the date in the in the basis set, and after solving this equation, we we come to a matrix equation, which is called the Fock uh, equation. And here we have an operator, which is a matrix. This is a second matrix for the coefficients of the basic sets. And one is also to take care of the overlap between the wave punk, the, the, the basis sets. And this is the matrix for the energies. So how to uh, solve this problem? So initially we provide the, the code with some input geometry, then electron integrals are computed. And then based on this, this information the, from the electron integrals, one initial density matrix can be computed. This is not the, the, the real density matrix. This is just the first step. And based on this density matrix, we compute or build the Fock matrix, which is this F here. After that, we then diagonalize the Fock matrix, update the density matrix again, and check if this procedure converges up to some uh, value, pre-established, predetermined value, and if not, we come again to the beginning and build again the fog matrix and repeat the, this process until we reach a convergence. If the convergence can be achieved, sometimes it cannot be achieved. And you need to modify the input ge geometry. So this is called the self-consistent uh, procedure. And that's why uh, that's, that's because we cannot solve this 
equation as we do uh, uh, usually in linear algebra, when we just invert the matrix, in this case, the fog matrix, and then compute the coefficients here. We cannot do that because this matrix depends on the coefficients as, as well. And that's why it's a nonlinear problem. And we need to uh, compute it using a self-consistent procedure. So this is a computational cost uh, information. So look at, at, the, at the following cost, mm, by using the particle mesh evil, is case as n log n, when n is the number of particles. In the case of Hartree-Fock or density functional theory, the scaling could be n to the three or n to the four. A model per set calculation is, is n to the fifth. And the coupled cluster, a single double and some part of the triple goes up to n to the seven. So this is what, what you expect in your calculations as, as you increase the level of uh, accuracy. So how to deal with the QMM Hamiltonian? There are several schemes and one of them is called the subtractive. So we saw here that we had a, 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 a system which is treated classically and work part which can be treated uh, quantum mechanically. So in the subtractive scheme, we first compute everything with the classical MM force field. Then in addition to that, we compute the QMM part. And when we have this part ready, we subtract the part that we compute exactly the same, but using the classical uh, scheme. Um, this is easy to parallelize, but it's not always convenient because here we will need a MMM force field that can deal somehow with the bond breaking and forming. And that's not uh, very easy and, and very robust in classical MM. So a better approach I would say is the additive approach where we have the system and here only the part that is treated classically is, is handled by the classical uh, package. And the other part is treated by the, by the quantum mechanical uh, package. So how the coupling could be? Uh, there are different types of couplings. The first one is the mechanical embedding. And basically here, you do the calculation of the QMM part uh, without the solvent, without anything. And, and in this case, you add just the contributions from the QMM part into the MM a calculation, for instance, the energies and the forces. So all the interactions are neglected between the charges in the MM part and the QMM part. Uh, this, uh, uh, this approach is, is strive forward to implement in any code because you can take any M, MM code, any uh, QMM code, just pass the, the, the positions and the velocities and forces and everything will work. Yes, you don't need to, to, to do more, more than that. The second approach is called the electrostatic embedding. And in this case, the QMM part, the QMM atoms, will take into account what are the charges of the atoms in the MM part, right? 
So they will see this electrostatic uh, contribution from the MMM charges. And so one needs to uh, parameterize the Van der Waals interactions, which are evaluated at the MMM level. So the most accurate uh, approach will be the polarization in bidding, where uh, both the charges in the QMM part and the ones in the MM part can be uh, polarized mutually. So they can see each other. In this case, only the QMM part can take into account the charges of the MM part, right? And here, both the MM and the QMM charges can change depend on the environment of the, of the others. However, this uh, approach is still uh, under development and, and this one is very mature. So this is the one that we will be using today. So solving the QMM Hamiltonian with electrostatic embedding, we can separate the wave function as follows. For the QMM part, we split the energy uh, contribution for QM plus MM. And this a Hamiltonian can be written as follows. So essentially is the QMM part that is obtained from the, uh, the quantum chemical package. And this is the interaction between the, the, electro, the, the, the electronic and the MM charges, right? So this is the, the Hamiltonian that we need to solve. We can use the linear combination of atomic orbitals method and the total expression uh, can be found here. This is basically the electro electronic part, uh, the nuclear repulsion part, the nuclear uh, part times the, the MM uh, uh, part. And this is the Van der Waals uh, interaction. Then we have a boundary and the MM part. So this is the, the situation that I mentioned before. For the Hartree Fock, we need to solve a self consistent field uh, procedure. And there are uh, some issues related to the QMM region. Uh, first of all, what type of atom, what, what atoms uh, need to be included in the region? And uh, for instance, it will depend strongly on your system. You need to know. Uh, how your system uh, behaves and, and you need to know the chemistry uh, and some, uh, to have some intuition of what are the important uh, uh, regions. So also in case you have some metals, uh, then you need to take into account a first observation layer for this, this part. And another issue will be what met method you need to use. So there are some very precise uh, uh, and accurate methods. And here, for instance, you can see the, the molar preset or the couple cluster and copper cluster is the gold standard up to this point. But if you start your, uh, your exploration of the system with these with this, uh, methods, then it will take a very long time to get to know uh, your system. So 
Uh, for that, there are other methods like uh, semi-empirical that are faster and they can give you an idea of what, uh, the, how the system behaves and what uh, residues or molecules need to be included, right? And once you have a very good intuition of how it looks like, like the energies, like the geometries of the small compounds or the, or the region, then you can go and, and try a more expensive method. So I would suggest to go first with the, some semi-empirical method, then uh, go for some DFT, and after that, uh, try some uh, more accurate model like the couple cluster if possible. And that will give you an idea of how uh, realistic your results are, right? Because if at some point you see what, uh, some behavior at the semi-empirical level, but you observe something very different at the DFT level, it means that uh, something, something is occurring that you are not taking into account. But first I would suggest to start with a fast method, for instance, an empirical one. And there are different flavors like AM1, PM3, and it's a DFTB, for instance. Another thing, when you go to a method like DFT, then you need to consider how large the basic set needs to be. And this uh, basic set is the expansion in terms of some uh, basic function that I mentioned before. So here there is a comment, usually the answer de uh, depending on the, uh, depend on the total cost of the calculation. Many QMS simulation have used an empirical method and only recently employ a, a ab initio QMM method. So previously, only semi-empirical method could be afforded. And now more accurate can be also used, right? This gives you an idea of how the system behaves, but uh, they are not very, very accurate, right? So this is how the scaling behavior looks like. There are the, the ab initio methods, Hartree Fock and Muller Placid. And this here is the scaling, n to the fourth, n to the fifth. And DFT, the scaling is f to the, the fourth. And the semi empirical method is n to the, the three. So, what will be the advantage of using the semi empirical method? Uh, the, the good point is that. Here you can run your system for longer time steps, longer longer simulation time, sorry, and then you can get a very a, a better statistics or better sampling on your system. For instance, there are some cases when reactions are studied at a, a very very accurate level, yeah but they run only for a few uh, picosecond time scale. And then, uh, although they are very accurate for this uh, simulation time, they do not take into account the motion, for instance, of residues or small molecules in the active site, right? And semi-empirical method can help you because they can run up to 100 of nanoseconds. So also the parallel efficiency, uh, in general, the codes have been well parallelized for DFT and heart refog, but the semi-empirical method uh, have not been uh, worked out for this uh, efficiency well. So another issue with the QMM simulation is the 
the, cho the choice of boundary. So here we have a QMM region. And because at some point we need to break the bone, right? We need to tell the, the, the packages, the MM and QMM packages, how you will deal with this situation, right? Where we just cut a band. Yeah, that's good. that could uh, cause several instabilities if we don't take into account it properly. So there are several uh, approaches like uh, the link, H-link atom approach, where we just capped the atom by using a hydrogen atom, for instance. And this is simple to implement. This is the one that is using NAMD. And nothing can be, uh, nothing needs to be done uh, in the chemical and the MM packages. So it's a straightforward. Another approach is by using a two uh, link atoms, one for the one for the QMM and one for the MM part. There are other approaches like the pseudo bond that also uses a cap uh, atom approach. And a more uh, detailed method is by using uh, orbitals and frozen one, one of, of, of these orbitals. Uh, for instance, in the case of, in the case of, uh, of the local self-consistent field method, uh, one consider a, a set of orbitals for the QMM atom at the boundary, right? And uh, it takes one of the orbitals pointing to the MM part as a frozen orbital. Issue with this could be the transferability and also it's not easy to implement. So one needs to do some coding in the QMM part and also in the MM part. So that will involve the people from NAMD, for instance, and the people from Orca or Gaussian to take into account this part. And this is an issue. Uh, another approach is the generalized orbit, hybrid orbital GHO developed by Jai Li Gao and others. Uh, here, the orbitals that are, that are frozen are uh, included in the QMM region, but only the orbital that is pointing to the QMM region is the one that is the active. There is another uh, uh, approach that is called frozen uh, uh, orbital approximation that is included in the Jaguar uh, program. So the third issue with the QMM part is the electrostatics. How will you deal with the electrostatics? We saw that uh, the computation of the sum for periodic boundary conditions, it not, it's not the straightforward in classical simulation and is the same in quantum mechanical simulations. There are some approaches to deal with this. And the, the one that was used in the past was simply to take a cutoff and ignore, for instance, all the interactions that were beyond the, this cutoff. And it was then discovered that uh, using a drastic cutoff will uh, induce some energy drift, right? And because of that, uh, the, the long range interactions need to be included properly. There are different ways to do that. And one is by using the, the particle mesh e world interaction, but also there are uh, another uh, recent approaches like the ambient uh, environment, ambient potential composite e world from Derek York uh, and, and others. The multiple moments from uh, Rollis Berger and the ESP shell, shell PG charges from Herbert. Also, uh, Walter Thiel proposed uh, uh, an approach 
and uh, there is an approach called augmented charges. So uh, now I will talk about the uh, computation of free energies, but this is something that is missing in my current uh, setup. And uh, for future courses, I will try to, to do this type of, of simulations, but today we won't look at these uh, free energy simulations because in general, they are uh, first uh, very time consuming, right? And uh, in the free energy calculations, we can compute the so-called potential of mean force. And here, uh, this is just one setup by using uh, umbrella sampling. In umbrella sampling, we define a reaction coordinate. And based on this reaction coordinate, we compute the free energy as a function of the predefined uh, coordinate. For instance, here you are uh, looking at the transfer of a hydrogen atom uh, from one group called A to another called B. And then we can define the reaction coordinate at the, as the, the difference of distance between these two, two uh, uh, compounds. And then we set the reaction coordinate, and we compute the so-called windows. We divide the entire reaction coordinate into pieces, and then we make a sampling uh, for each of the of the windows for each of the of the values of this predefined reaction coordinate, right? And that's why it's it's very time consuming because we don't we need to run many simulations at the same time so free energy difference can be used for many things like computing the solvation free energy the pka calculation or the binding free energy for instance and there are different approaches here I'm showing you the thermodynamic integration, yes, which is quite uh, straightforward to implement. And there are also pathway me methods where you leave the system at each of these windows to evolve and then collect the statistics. Uh, for instance, one can use the string method in this case. See here, this simulation requires more than one nanosecond for the convergence. So there are uh, some calculations that use um, very precise, very accurate uh, quantum chemistry methods, but they cannot sam sample more than, than five picoseconds, for instance. And even though one can compute these uh, uh, energy profiles and the part that may be uh, missing is the entropic part right and that's why semi-empirical methods are uh, very useful for that so this is a comparison of the time the, the speeds that can be achieved so a classical mm uh, simulation can achieve up to 100 nanoseconds per day running on gpus on cpus uh, 40 nanoseconds per day if we use a semi-empirical approach right we can achieve uh, around 0.2 nanoseconds per day and by using a a abm qmm method look at the time scales 0 0.001 nanoseconds per day there are several reasons for that. And one of them is that uh, in order to, to use a quantum chemi chemistry uh, method, uh, we need to decrease the time step of the simulation. In a classical MD, one uses 
a one femtosecond, but if we move to a quantum chemical method, then we need to decrease that even further. So in the self-consistent field iteration, you saw that uh, in this case, la like n to the three in the, in the fog matrix of ionization. So there are several ways to, to reduce that. For instance, one can try to minimize the number of self-consistent field iteration, or one can apply approaches like the extended Lagrangian to, to make the simulations faster. So uh, this is how a, a standard computation looks like for the QMM PME. So first the PME energy is computed, then the gradients, then the bonded energy, and finally the non-bonded energy. And then the MM part is added. So inside this part, the QMM part, there are different QMM routines, right? And one of the most expensive one is the self-consistent field procedure that we saw before. This involves the construction of the Fock matrix and the diagonalization and the density matrix updates. So this is the most time consuming part. So we did a profiling previously for the charm code together with MMBO. And this is how it looked like, right? And here we saw, we, we are seeing that only one core is used. So the division of this time here is uh, for the full diagonalization and the Fock matrix construction and so on. So then we try an implementation in parallel mode with MPI and, and OpenMP. And we could achieve up to 16 cores. And you see the speed up that you can get. And this was done in the charm code. The changes should be available now in the charm package. In addition to that, uh, we tried an extended Lagrangian where you propagate the density matrix and do some correction to the density for verifying the orthogonality. And this allows you to decrease the number of self-consistent field uh, steps. If we use the, the uh, Lagrangian approach, we can see that the speed up uh, increases. In addition to that, one can implement extended Lagrangian molecular dynamics where the, the truth density uh, matrix is propagated and then no correction needs to be done, right? So these are similar approaches. So how to speed up even further the calculations? One can decompose the entire system into layers and then uh, one can achieve uh, faster and longer time scales. For instance, in this case, in the, the entire system is decomposed into a MM part, then a layer where the, the system is treated uh, in some way. And then just the, the the inner layer where we are interested in uh, can be modeled with a very, very accurate and costly uh, method, right? So it also, instead of using a classical MM approach, one can use a semi-empirical approach at this level, another type of method at this level, and, and the most accurate at the binding site, for instance, close to the reaction. And this type of calculation is called the onion method. So one can achieve also some speed up in with this scheme. 
And let me tell you some further comments. Uh, you need to know the, you, your system. You need to know or have a, an intuition of what, what happens in your, in, your, in your system and what are the parts that are most relevant to be included in the QMM region. So depends on the type of accuracy that you, you need. You can choose DFT or semi-empirical method. In my case, I am biased towards the semi-empirical method because they are faster and one can achieve more uh, sampling time scale, but they are not very good at uh, predicting energies, for instance. Aspect for the parametrization of the van der Waals and semi-empirical methods. So you need to, to see how the van der Waals parameters behave. Uh, the size of the QMM region. There are some works that suggest that the size is not that important, but you also need to, to consider the first solvation shell as mentioned before and to include that properly. So uh, for some crystal structures, you can do some modeling and docking if you don't know uh, how the natural substrates are. An additional issue is the boundary treatment, how you will treat the, the, the bond, the dangling bond. And in NAMD, for instance, is attacked by the by the H-link approach, but there are many uh, ways to do that. Periodic boundary condition, PME is a well-established scheme. And this is the one that is used in NAMD and the quantum chemistry packages. So most of this, uh, or I think uh, yes, most of these methods that I mentioned here are included in the charm code. And, and they, they could be uh, used, but this is uh, a software that I will not deal with today. Right? Is there any questions at this point?